Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Tim Levitz. I'm with Special Collections. I appreciate your patience with the parking as we get all this uh, figured out. And I apologize for the age. Uh, today, we're privileged to have uh, Sylvia Ramos Cruz as our speaker. Uh, she's a retired general and risk surgeon, poet, writer, and women's rights activist, still working on, the, on working to get the Equal Rights Amendment into the Constitution. Uh, she writes poems inspired by her art, women's lives, and, and everyday injustices. Uh, many have roots in places she calls home, Puerto Rico, New York, and New Mexico. Her photographs and award-winning poems have appeared in local and national publications, including Alpine Review, Southwestern American Literature Journal, Encore Prize Poems 2017, Journal, Journal of Latina Critical Feminism and Artemis 2020 and 2021, and Albuquerque Railroad Rail Yards Trilogy, which is a three-part poetry and photography collage installation. Yeah. Uh, and it's in the city of Albuquerque's public art collection. Her ongoing work focuses on women's history in New Mexico. In 2018, the centennial of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution Women's suffrage inspired her to research and write about the suffrage movement in New Mexico and the people who took part in it. Since then, she has presented her findings at various in person and online, local, and national venues, and published articles online and in print media. Please welcome Silvia Ramos Cruz. Thank you very much, Tim. And I want to thank the Albuquerque Special Collections Library for inviting me to speak, and all of you for coming here this morning to hear about this history. Um, I will be happy to take, uh, to take uh, questions and especially comments at the end of the presentation. Uh, can you all hear me well? Yes. Great. So before I start the presentation, I want to say that since the beginning of this nation, many citizens have been and still are being kept out of the voting booth despite constitutional amendments and laws to protect their voting rights. So although we celebrate women winning the vote in 1920, it's important to remember that the march for universal suffrage in this country continues. I believe that history is the scaffold upon which we build our future. Sadly, we tend to forget our history almost as soon as we make it, and we forget its lessons. That is why it's so important that we keep uncovering women's stories who were left out of our history books and out of the collective consciousness. As you may see from the variety of endeavors these women were involved in, they had rich and diverse lives. Among them, as you see, are mothers, artists, teachers, singers, and many more. In my research, I have found quite a bit of material for some of them, and just a bit for others. I know the material I have found is a minuscule amount, uh, viewed uh, from the perspective of their lifespan and the complexity of their lives. Though my focus was on their suffrage activity, sometimes I detoured into the rest of their lives. My intention today is to look at some of those suffrages and how they work to move the campaign forward. Their stories hold lessons we can use today. Of necessity, given the time limitation, this will be a bird's eye view. I hope some of you will feel inspired to go on unearthing the stories of so many of these women who are still around. They're not around, but the stories are around in their families, in family albums, etc. The demographics of New Mexico were such in 1910. The population was 360,365 people. 83% lived in rural areas, and almost half were non-English speakers. Native Americans were 6%. African Americans and Asians comprised less than 1% of the population. Among women, 56% were Nuevo Mexicanas. The suffrage movement in New Mexico grew out of the same sentiments that compelled Lucretia Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Susan B. Anthony to launch the effort. It grew from women's desire to have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness acknowledged. 
from women's desire to be recognized as capable of participating equally in the government that ruled their civic lives, capable of tackling needs they saw in their communities in areas such as public education, hygiene, libraries, alcohol abuse, and lynching. He grew from knowing that their fathers, husbands, and male relatives did not see the world exactly as they did, and therefore could not and should not speak for them at the ballot box. He grew from the realization that no matter how well they had studied the issues and how carefully they had proposed an agenda for change, politicians were unwilling to listen to people who had no vote. In the end, women had to cast the ballot themselves, and they set out to win it. The March for Suffrage in New Mexico begins in 1874, where a resolution for suffrage was first introduced in the New Mexico legislature. And it ended in 1921, when women in New Mexico were able to not only um, vote for school suffrage, but also to run for all elections and vote in all elections having to do with the state elections uh, or state processes, um, not just for the school board. Hundreds of women contributed to that victory. I have the names of some of those, sto of some of those women and the stories for a few of them. Uh, they're, um, they're very hard to find, as you know. Uh, they have to be teased out of many documents, sometimes uh, songs, sometimes uh, newspaper articles, etc. But uh, aside from the 100 women whose names I have, there were many others who marched, sold banners, mimeographed flyers, lobbied legislators, took turns caring for children while their suffrage sisters went to rally, and stood up to ridicule for wanting the vote. Most of those names remain unknown. Unknown. Suffragette or suffragists? What's the difference? Suffragette refers to women in England who wanted the vote. It was initially a derogatory term that they adopted and wore it proudly. In the United States, anyone, man or woman, who uh, believes in everyone universal suffrage, everyone having the vote, is called a suffragist. Despite ridicule, suffragists made inroads in their campaign for a greater voice in politics and acceptance of their work outside the home through their civic work that benefited all in the community. At the Industrial Day Parade that closed the State Fair in 1914, women's clubs marched in the Third Division. I'm sorry to say that I am unable to get this little video to play. Um, it shows 17 seconds of the parade, and uh, you will see, well, you would have seen, uh, the, the whole long marching uh, line of people. First came the YMCA, then came the Women's uh, Christian Temperance Union in wagons, then came the Vote for Women cars, uh, with full of suffragists, and behind the suffragists uh, would have been a float um, of the, with the baby who won the Better Babies contest. Um, and, and you would have seen the people lining the sidewalks, if there were sidewalks at that time, uh, that uh, were cheering, and uh, cheering for everyone. There were no tomatoes being thrown at anybody, or, uh, or any uh, bad signs that said women go home. So it was a very joyous affair. But despite that celebration, there was still a long way for women to go before they were accepted as equals in the voting booth. Most of the work of mobilizing and training women to work for suffrage and educating the public about the benefits of, uh, of women having the vote was done in women's clubs. In those homes away from home, women learned to study issues, debate their merits, speak in public, compose letters and articles for newspapers, organize meetings, and keep marching when all seemed lost. The preponderance of members in those clubs were middle-class, well-connected, Euro-American urban women. At a time when most women didn't finish high school, most of those women were college-educated. They kept up with world events, scientific discoveries, and new ideas. Many were employed, a few were Hispanas. By 1911, there were 15 clubs scattered around New Mexico. For the most part, early records of club activities are not available. Unlike national suffragists who wrote and published the six volumes of the history of women's suffrage 
almost as it unfolded between 1881 and 1921, many clubs did not document their work for their history books or even for their members. However, some clubs, like the Silver City Women's Club, kept careful handwritten minutes. Others may not have, as I said, but even when the clubs kept the minutes, finding out if someone still has them and where they are located is really difficult. You can see from the notes, and I'm not sure you can read, but uh, they were very, the women in any of the minutes I have seen had very careful handwriting and were very precise. Um, you can see the topics they addressed. They comprised what has sometimes been, been called maternalistic politics or social housekeeping issues because they focused on ideas deemed important to women and children, as if men would not have been affected by any of these issues. I believe those terms, uh, maternalistic politics and social housekeeping, were intended to diminish the importance of women's work, not only inside the house, but also outside. While the work of suffragists benefited all the New Mexicans at that time and continues to benefit us now, club women excluded many from their ranks. Working through the fact of segregated organizations, they missed out on the opportunity to engage with women of color who also labored to uplift their, li their lives and their communities through colored women's clubs, churches, civic groups, and family organizations. A word about men. As we know, they were the only ones who could vote. Women relied on them to carry their voices into legislative chambers. Without their support, the ballot would not have been won. Many men in New Mexico took part in that effort. Among them are four whose work was invaluable, especially towards the end of the campaign. Solomon Luna was the most powerful Republican leader at the Territorial Constitutional Convention in 1910. He was the uncle of suffragist Nina Otero Warren and supported women voting in school board elections. He worked to see it included in the state's constitution in 1912. Washington Lindsay was the third New Mexico state governor. He espoused progressive policies and worked actively with his wife, Deanne, to convince legislators to vote for unrestricted women suffrage. Andreas Jones became chair of the Senate Select Committee on Women's Suffrage in 1916. He worked to get the amendment, also called the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, passed and sent to the states for ratification. By the time it went to the states, Three quarters of uh, referenda across the country, in every state, three quarters of the states agreed to have that women should have the vote. That was the work of women suffragists across the country. The two million volunteers found out across the United States that had uh, worked with the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Octaviano Larrazolo was the fourth New, uh, New Mexico governor, and he is the first uh, naturalized American to have become a, citizen, uh, a senator of the United States. He supported the vote for women, and in January 21, called for a special election, a special session of the New Mexico legislature to, write the amend, to ratify the amendment and amend the New Mexico state constitution to include women's suffrage. Both of those tasks were accomplished. By 1914, there were two major suffrage organizations in New Mexico, the Moderate National Women's Suffrage Association, or NAUSA for short, had been in New Mexico since 1900. The Militant Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage came in 1914. The suffragists joined one or more of the, of the one or another of the organizations, uh, but sometimes suffragists in New Mexico belonged to both. Uh, sometimes these organizations were at loggerheads over strategy, and sometimes they collaborated. Here is one time when they were at loggerheads. Women in Washington, D.C. had picketed the White House and had banners say, calling uh, President Wilson, Kaiser Wilson, Wilson. They had been attacked by a mob of men who ripped the flags and also called the women traitors. Of course, the women were the ones who were arrested and jailed. They went to jail for three days. Finally, they were released, and one of them uh, was asked to come to New Mexico to celebrate in Santa Fe by the more uh, militant part of the suffragists in the state. 
On the other hand, Mrs. B. M. Lucy, the wife of the governor, was more conservative, more moderate in her in her approach, and she wrote uh, a letter to the president uh, and saying, of course, this was not really uh, the way that women in New Mexico behaved, and and they did not support those tactics. And he wrote back a very nice uh, telegram uh, thanking her for that. But uh, so uh, even women here. There are loggerheads sometimes over strategies on how to best to get the amendment uh, finally ratified. Some, uh, oh, sorry, when the Congressional Union came to New Mexico, the hunt for the vote became a roar. Some of those who roared were just joining the campaign, others had been fighting for decades. They ranged in age from 19 years to 63 years of age. Some, like Adelina Otero Warren, may already be known to you. She has been featured in newspaper articles recently, and she became one of the women of the first five orders to honor women's work uh, in the United States by the U.S. Mint. Ada McPherson Worley was, in her own words, always and ever on the alert to gain my own liberty. For over 25 years, she, gave, she worked to gain the ballot in New Mexico, yet died without holding it in her hands. Mrs. Morley had a strong civic conscience, and even as a young woman who was an activist, who often wrote letters to elected officials and politicians to, get, to castigate or commend them for their actions. Beginning in 1915, she wrote hundreds of letters to congressional delegates, legislators, and friends urging support for women's vote. She was an early member of the Women's Christian Temperance Union and served as president. In 1890, she proposed and led the suffrage department for the group. Just prior to the Constitutional Convention in 1910, uh, there was a meeting in Mountaineer, and the uh, union held what must have been the first public debate on women's suffrage in the state. Although she was a widow and a rancher raising three children of her own in the town of Dapil, she regularly rode her cart almost 100 miles to and from Albuquerque to participate in club meetings and club activities. In 1914, she joined the Congressional Union and worked to further its mission. Even as she was ailing in 1916, she participated in a large suffrage rally held in Magdalena, where she was also honored for her work. On her death in 1917, the Evening Herald wrote, Great woman gone, no more brainy idealist ever lived than this Tolstoy of the Dattles. The emancipation of women by enfranchisement was a life work with Mrs. Morley. Deanne Lindsay led most of the women's rights, suffrage, and service organizations in the state. Among them were the Temperance Union, the Federation of Women's Clubs, and now some. She was a tireless crusader for the rights of women and children and a better community for all. Although their goal was full suffrage, early on women realized that the most they would probably get would be a vote for school boards. Therefore, in 1900 and again in 1910, Mrs. Lindsay, along with many other suffrage groups, lobbied members of the legislature, the territorial legislature, and then the uh, uh, um, constitutional convention to grant women uh, the voting school elections. They did win that limited voting right. And in fact, uh, the, the elections were heard, held at separate times because women could only vote for that, which is why in New Mexico, the school elections had been held at different times from the other elections. I think they recently were joined together on the same day. But that's why that uh, went on for years. Over the years, Mrs. Lindsay organized statewide women's clubs and suffrage group meetings that focused on women's agenda for change. In 1918, during World War I, she chaired the New Mexico branch of the Women's Civilian Committee on National Defense. The committee was responsible for surveying the skills New Mexico women could contribute at home to the national war effort. Without those skills and willingness of women to work in traditionally male jobs, Tens of thousands of men needed at the front would not have been available for wartime service. 
Despite her husband's tenure, I'm sorry, during her husband's tenure as governor, she organized and hosted several strategy meetings before legislative sessions at the governor's mansion. Moderate, moderate and militant suffrage leaders in the state we put aside their uh, disagreements and worked on how to convince legislators before the legislative sessions to pass the suffrage amendment. Her work alongside others for over 20 years helped secure laws that benefited women, children, and men throughout the states, laws that we still have in the books. Sometimes it's hard to tell what people's personality is like from photographs especially post ones. This one shows Margaret Cartwright when she joined the Albuquerque medical community in 1908. She seems very straight-laced and conventional. Yet I do have a newspaper report of Dr. Cartwright being cited for speeding. <laughs> Perhaps in one of those very cars. Uh, she and her, one of her offices was in the Kistler Collister building on Central and Third. Uh, and, uh, she may have very well on um, one of those. Of course, she may have been speeding to get up to the place where she needed to deliver a baby. And she was also a modern woman. When her second marriage did not work out, she got a divorce. Margaret Cartwright is another example of how the suffragists were adept at what we now call multitasking. She was founder and first president of the YWCA in Albuquerque in 1910. She was president of the Temperance Union twice and superintendent of his child welfare department. She was also a member of Albuquerque Women's Club, Albuquerque Business and Professional Women's Club, and now some. Dr. Cartwright practiced medicine, mainly obstetrics and gynecology, in Albuquerque for 34 years. She was Bernalillo County Chairman of the American Medical Association's Committee on Public Health and Education and County Chairman of the Subcommittee on affiliated public health work. She did all this while raising six children, partly on her own, after the death of her husband in 1912. Interestingly for our times, in 1931, she was tried for having performed an abortion. The jury returned eight to four undecided, and the judge dismissed the case. Prior to moving to Albuquerque in 1908, she had been a Methodist missionary practicing medicine with her husband in Mexico for 17 years. She was fluent in Spanish. On November 24, 1920, she was part of a delegation that accompanied Governor Octaviano Solo to Mexico City for the inauguration of Mexico's president-elect, General Álvaro Obregón. Her obituary in 1940 stated, she was well known as one of the leading women physicians in the Southwest and as an active participant in all movements looking to the betterment of living conditions for women and children. Cora Kellum dedicated her life to activism for women's rights. After the 19th Amendment was ratified, she joined Alice Paul in the 99-year-long campaign to get the Equal Rights Amendment into the Constitution. She was a member of the Albuquerque Women's Club, the Greater Federation of Women's Clubs, the Christian Temperance Union. Her suffrage activities began in 1896 through the Territorial Association for Women's Suffrage. She joined the Congressional Union in 1914 and traveled back and forth several times to Washington, D.C. to lobby congressmen for suffrage prior to 1920 and for the ERA after. I am always amazed at how these women in their voluminous, uh, really hot clothes and petticoats and hats and gloves managed to get on those iron horses, the trains of that time, and go back and forth, uh, you know, across the country. Uh, Carrie Chapman Cadman from New York to California uh, many times. So they traveled uh, for the cause that they espoused. The National Women's Party had opposed President Woodrow Wilson's re-election in 1916. The National Women's Party was founded by Alice Paul and grew out of the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage. Nevertheless, as chairman of the New Mexico branch of the National Women's Party and delegate for the um, Council of National Defense, uh, Cora Kellum 
met with President and Mrs. Wilson at the White House in 1918. She spoke to him along with several other women who were there, and she said, Mr. President, we women of the West are growing very restless indeed, waiting for the long delayed passage of the federal suffrage amendment. Women in New Mexico and other states are eagerly awaiting for action on this measure in the Senate. Won't you help us? The president said, I will. I will do all I can. And as a matter of fact, he did. Hmm. He went to the Senate and asked for the vote for women as a war measure, saying, we have made partners in the war of, uh, we have made partners of women in the war. Shall we admit them only to a partnership of suffering and sacrifice and toil, and not to a partnership of privilege and right? In June 1919, 50 years after its introduction in Congress, the Women's Suffrage Amendment went to the states for ratification. Despite ongoing, ongoing, sorry, despite ongoing grief at the death of her only son and chronic disabling physical pain, Cora Kellum persisted as a vocal advocate of equal rights for women until her death. It wasn't only her only son, it was her only child. Mo and McPhee Boone grew up in a home where both parents were suffragists and founding members of the Territorial Association for Equal Suffrage. Throughout her life, she took part in women's club activities wherever she lived, Las Cruces, Albuquerque, Santa Fe. The Albuquerque Women's Club was founded in 1903. It was disbanded, disbanded in 2013 due to dwindling membership after 200 and uh, sorry, after 110 years of service. As the club historian, Mrs. Bloom wrote the 50th anniversary booklet in 1953. The first year, they enrolled 84 members, of whom five were Hispanic, surnamed. The sometimes humorous and detailed booklet gives insight into 50 years of women's activism in Albuquerque. Though the club was begun for the betterment of women morally and intellectually, it morphed into a political organization that activated and worked for community improvement and women's rights. This page, pardon me. Oh, it must be out of sync. Sorry. Oh, okay. The slide is missing. Sorry. So the page um, was uh, from the booklet itself, and it had made uh, more than the blues annotations in uh, blue, blue ink. Uh, the annotation she had was the first year of the uh, Las Cruces uh, Women's uh, Club was founded, they got the first hearse for Las Cruces. The first hearse in 1884. This is, sorry, no, here we go. Yeah. So, Moin McPhee Bloom was an active member of NAMSA and was a speaker at suffrage meetings um, quite often. She wrote this letter to her husband after a suffrage meeting at which she spoke in 1918. That also happened to be on his birthday coming up. Uh, but she was in Santa Fe, and he was in Magdalena, where he was the Presbyterian minister. She may have traveled to, from Magdalena to Santa Fe to attend suffrage league meetings, as well as to give the, uh, the speech. She's among the 42 New Mexico women included uh, included in the history of women's suffrage for their work to win the vote in New Mexico. Six of the women included in that final tone are uh, members of the Albuquerque Women's Club. Adelina Otero Warren was born into well-to-do, well-connected, politically influential New Mexico families. They sparked her interest in politics and community service. She lived in New York City from 1912 to 1914 while keeping house for her brother who was attending Columbia University. While there, she volunteered at a settlement house where she provided direct services and worked to reshape public policy toward poor and working families. Settlement houses, of course, advocated for suffrage. In 
Her work for suffrage in New Mexico began alongside her uncle, Solomon Luna, in 1910, at that convention where women got only suffrage for school board elections. In 1914, she joined the Congressional Union and was one of only six Hispanic registered members. She was fully bilingual and worked to educate the public about how women casting their own votes would benefit families and communities. Through her leadership in both the Hispanic and Anglo communities, she wrote to be, she rose to be chair of the New Mexico branch of the Congressional Union in 1917. That same year, she was appointed as a superintendent of the school board in uh, Santa Fe. For years, she worked with congressional members in Washington, D.C. and with the New Mexico legislature to strengthen and steady their resolve to vote for suffrage. Her political savvy was invaluable in this work. By the time Mrs. Warren began the last push with Republican leaders to get them behind the amendment in January 1920, the groundwork had been done by hundreds of New Mexico women who had worked tirelessly for this moment for over 46 years. They had shown their ability to organize and get things done at home, in communities, factories, and farms. Minds had been open to the idea that all men and women are created equal. During the final day of the New Mexico Legislature's special session, February 18, 1920, she stayed with the Republican caucus, the first woman to be allowed to do so, and overcame, uh, overcame the forces of resistance from patriarchal clergy and politicians who were not ready to accept women as equals in the voting booth. The women won. Three quarters of the members' voting was required, so the votes came in very close, but still, it was a win. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Isabella Selmes Ferguson's early life was spent among socialites and the families of both Theodore and Franklin Roosevelt in New York. Who could predict that she would become a homesteader, businesswoman, philanthropist, civic leader, politician, and legislator? In 1910, she moved to Silver City with her husband, who had tuberculosis, and their family. There, they initially lived in tents in the sanatorium compound, and later homesteaded and homeschooled the children in the Boulder Mountains. Periodically, they were visited by Theodore Roosevelt and Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt and their children in those humble abodes. Of her, it was said, she was a peculiar blend of Eastern establishment aristocracy and frontiers woman. In 1912, she canvassed in Silver City for Teddy Roosevelt's Bull Moose Party, whose platform advocated women's suffrage. That was her first foray into politics. She was a member of the Silver City Women's Club, which endorsed suffrage in 1914, and she served on the Grand County Board of Education. In 1918, she was asked to head the Women's Land Army, part of the Women's Council on the Committee of National Defense. Her task was to bring in the crops planted by men who had gone to war. 500 farmerettes joined her. Conditions were harsh in the fields, uh, 10 hours working in over 100 degree weather, bedding down at day's end, sometimes on alfalfa and pine boughs. And that was during the influence of pandemic of 1918. In fact, Isabella helped nurse some of her workers until they could be taken to hospitals. Nevertheless, the women smiled and got the job done. <laughs> in 1922, Mrs. Ferguson moved to Arizona after her husband's death. In 1934, she became Arizona's first woman and only representative in the United States Congress. Service during the war helped women show they were capable of tackling men's work while doing their own and of functioning in the world of politics. It showed women as able organizers and flexible managers. Of course they could handle the vote. Nineteen eleven, as a seventeen year old, Rora Lucero gave an impassioned speech. It was celebrated throughout the Southwest, urging the continued teaching of Spanish 
in public schools. And she also worked to bring uh, Hispanic, uh, the part of the part of the Hispanic population into the suffrage movement. Yet a four-page article about Aurora Lucero published in 1964 in Santa Fe magazine said nothing about her public speaking skills nor her suffrage work. <clears throat> that work began when she joined the Congressional Union in 1914. Excuse me. <clears throat> she was 19 years old and a renowned bilingual orator and a teacher in Tucumcari. By Nina Otero Warren, she was political and well connected. They were also similar in their advocacy for the preservation of the Spanish language and culture in New Mexico. The women joined hands to reach the Spanish-speaking population. They designed and distributed Spanish language promotional flyers. Her speech at a large rally called El Porvenir de los Niños, the future of children, stressed the health and well-being of children as reasons for women should have the vote. The large Spanish-American audience responded favorably and many joined the campaign. In 1915, there was a deputation of 150 suffragists in Santa Fe to ask Senator Thomas Catron to support women's suffrage. This photo shows some of the delegation and Senator Catron. Aurora Lucero spoke first. She said, I speak for the Spanish American women who want the best possible laws when it comes to their whole life and, and and children. I represent the daughters of the conquistadores who first reclaimed the country from the wilderness and all other women of the state. End of uh, the quotation. Of course, as we know, indigenous people were here long before the Spaniards came. Altogether, four women spoke that day, but the senator was not moved. He said women were the weaker sex whose role was to bear children, that they would be sullied by taking part in politics, that ladies wouldn't vote, only lower class women would. Throughout his tenure in the Senate, he opposed the vote for women. Nevertheless, women had the last laugh as the very next year, he was defeated in his run for another term by a pro-suffrage candidate. Most likely, women had had enough of the patriarchy and were able to move their relatives, male and male friends, to cast the vote that cast the senator out. As noted earlier, there are many women whose work for suffrage is still being uncovered. Some women did not join organizations or worked alongside them in less formal church and community groups. Many women of color were kept out of white women's clubs and out of the history books and records we have relied on for some of this history. I have not yet found specific evidence of participation by African American, indigenous, or Asian women in suffrage activities in New Mexico at that time. However, there are two African American women who may not work for the vote. Mary McIntosh graduated from Fisk University in Tennessee and worked as a teacher prior to her marriage. Her obituary states that her teachers had predicted a career for her as a writer, but she, but, she chose, she, but she chose instead the career of rearing a family. She moved to New Mexico in 1881 as a bride. Her husband, William Slaughter, was a self-made businessman. They had eight children. The family was considered prosperous and affluent, and among Santa Fe's pioneer citizens, having settled in the, in the city in 1883. In fact, their daughter's wedding was attended by black and white citizens and received extended coverage in the front page of the Santa Fe New Mexico newspaper in 1903. The book Bridges, New Mexico Black Women, 1900 to 1950, states that Mary Slaughter worked on the Santa Fe Women's Board of Trade and Library Association that was established in 1893, 92. The board was a women's club whose members were Euro-American with a sprinkling of Hispanic women. Their goals were betterment of the city parks and cemetery and establishment of a library. And they also worked for suffrage. I have not yet ascertained what Mary Slaughter's role was in the organization, what it means that she worked on it. I do have a copy of a commentary in the Santa Fe Reporter in 1984 entitled 
If color had not set their destiny, it states, if Mary Slaughter had been white, more than likely her name would be on the bronze plaque in the foyer of the Santa Fe Public Library, listed with the elite group of women who founded the Women's Board of Trade and Library Association in 1892. She was educated, a hard worker, wanted the betterment of her community, and had a prosperous husband, all general criteria for membership. But at that time in America, skin color was destiny. I also have a voter list for the, 19, for the 1926 general election in Santa Fe. Both Mary and her husband are listed. I think that qualifies her as a suffragist. I'm really trying to tease you know, all this information out, and sometimes I make assumptions, but I believe those are, those are warranted. Lula Black was born in Kentucky and was an educator and a high school principal in San Francisco before moving to Albuquerque. She was an accomplished musician and was choir director and Sunday school uh, supervisor at the Grand Chapel AME Church, which is still in existence uh, today in Albuquerque. In 1914, Mrs. Black organized the Home Circle Club with eight other matrons for intellectual, social, and moral uplift, the same kinds of goals that the white women's clubs have. They held meetings in her home. Sadly, I have not yet found any records about their specific activities in those early years. According to Rio Caldera, the, club, the club's current president, it wasn't until 1925 that they began to keep, to keep minutes. However, from the beginning, they focused on education, child care, and professional advancement. They also addressed lynchings and segregation, and were most likely involved in suffrage activities. The National Association of Colored Women's Clubs had endorsed a woman's suffrage in 1912, the Home Circle was founded in 1914, and it was originally part of that network. The Home Circle Club is still active and continues to provide scholarships to college students. This is their uh, 2014 year celebration. Um, they, um, they still do the same kind of work, including the scholarships for students, especially college students. Mrs. Black and her daughter, Yola, took private vocal and piano lessons. After being told that she, Yola, and two other black students could not attend their graduation at the Albuquerque High School, Yola and the other two girls enrolled and graduated from a University of New Mexico program for high school students. She received what may have been the first music scholarship from the UNM School of Music. Subsequently, she married, Yola married, Theodore Rinson, a post office employee and violinist, who was a vocal proponent for the rights of Afro-American citizens in Albuquerque and in Mexico. I have uh, a copy of a newspaper uh, letter to the editor that he wrote. Lula Black and her family were activists for equal rights and justice. They had connections to the wider uh, African-American community in New Mexico, including the slaughters in Santa Fe. I believe they were for suffrage. Even without the vote, women were able to effect significant change prior to 1920. Among other reforms, the work led to raising the age of protection for girls from 10 to 14 years, creation of juvenile courts, protection of women's community property rights in marriage, and passage of prohibition. As 1920 approached and suffrage became a train rushing down the tracks, both political parties scrambled to get on and bring women to their side. Once women won the vote, politicians realized that having women on their party tickets would benefit the parties. In 1922, several women from both parties were nominated, ran, and were elected to political office statewide. No, these are not New Mexico women, but they could be. Old Town historian Emma Moya told me that her grandmother, Mary Selby Moya, was the first Old Town Precinct chairwoman in 1919 for the Democratic Party. Emma also told me that for women in Old Town, voting was very important and elections were festive. Women who had access to cars would drive around picking up other women to take them to vote. I wish we still did that. 
goodness. I don't know whether Soledad Chavez Tacon was one of those old town women who drove the car or was driven. I do know that she was elected in Mexico's first woman secretary of state in 1922. Soledad Chavez was born into a well-established, influential New Mexico family. She received a degree in accounting from the Albuquerque Business College, married and had two children. She belonged to several women's clubs, including the Nerva Club, which advocated for suffrage. In 1922, she was asked by Democratic Party politicians to run for office. After consulting her male relatives, she agreed, and she won both the nomination and the race. Thus, as I said, she was the first woman Secretary of State in New Mexico, and the first Hispanic woman in the nation to win statewide elected office. She served two terms, winning re-election handily. She was praised for her work by historian Charles Cohen, who wrote, it is generally understood that the affairs of the office were never in better condition than under Mrs. Chacon's administration. I think her degree in business really helped in that. In 1934, she was elected to the New Mexico House of Representatives and was in her second year in office when she died of peritonitis at the age of, I think, something like 36 years old. Her daughter, Lena Ward, said her mother enjoyed her service in state government. She had been career-minded when she completed her education and she felt her dreams were being fulfilled. As you may see from the sprinkling of New Mexico women, uh, these women were admirable in many ways. Nevertheless, they, like all of us, were not perfect. They had strongly held beliefs and just as strongly held biases. In their zeal for the vote, they sometimes compromised their principles. In their fervor to improve communities, they were sometimes drawn to movements later discredited or repudiated, such as the eugenics movement and alcohol prohibition. An example of this is the eugenics waves in Better Babies contest sponsored by the Albuquerque Women's Club in 1914. I admire about these women that they believed in themselves, believed in their ability to bring change that would benefit them, their children, families, and communities. And I admire that they banded together for decades, despite religious, political, economic, and social differences, to make true the dream they shared. I also admire the methodical way they went about the campaign for the vote. This is the kind of roadmap I saw uh, when I was researching them. First, you joined with like minded women. There were clubs for the betterment of women clubs for uh, addressing community problems, such as alcohol, clubs for suffrage. I would add to this, though, exclude no woman who can help. I believe that if all women had been pushing in the same direction together, they would have gotten farther much sooner than they did pushing along in parallel, direct, in parallel groups, but pushing in the same direction. Then you find out what are the, what are the concerns of the group what is going on in the community or parish? Then, um, what can be done about it? What is the goal that you have at the end? What do you want to happen once you have addressed the fact that there is an open uh, ditch with dirty water running behind several houses in the community where children are running around and they fall in? What, what is it that you want to accomplish? Then you have to know the audience, whether it's a Spanish-speaking public, young mothers with infant children and maternal health issues, or municipal officials or legislators. Who is the audience that you want to address with these specific issues that you see? You must build coalitions with other interested groups that have different constituencies. For example, the temperance movement, the literary clubs, the service organizations. Then get powerful, influential allies. Many of these women had influential husbands, and they themselves had careers where they met many influential people. Make your organization visible, known as being able to uh, look at issues, uh, uh, address them, and then uh, move forward. And then have uh, an effect, such as getting that purse for uh, Las Cruces, or getting the library in Santa Fe, or getting the uh, water fountain in uh, Las Vegas at the plaza, 
or getting the potter's field added to the cemetery in Albuquerque. And all the while, activate for your cause, rallies, political events, legislatures, write letters, activate all the time. And then when things don't go your way, as they will many times, and we saw that happen um, in 1917 here, where uh, both political parties said yes, they were for, uh, for the suffrage, but yet at the, at the legislature session, nothing happened on suffrage. So you have to go back, figure out what happened, regroup, and keep going. And then always, always keep your eyes on the prize. Yes, we can get the vote for school board, great, but that's not what we want, where we want to stop. We want to continue, we want to continue pushing this as much as we can, whenever we can. And then persevere. Suffragists came back year after year, nationally for over 72 years, in New Mexico for over 46 years. They came back until they won the vote. They didn't go home discouraged and hide. They came back. And then, of course, it's very important that you hold politicians accountable for what they said they would do. Many promises are made to us. One, for example, is uh, President Biden saying that he was for the ERA. And of course, uh, but yet he will not force the, he will not ask, he doesn't have to force, just has to ask the United States archivist to accept the amendment and publish it and then we will have the Equal Rights Amendment in the Constitution. I actually have a little book here uh, published by the Virginia, uh, the Virginia uh, Voters Project. Uh, this is our United States Constitution, where the Equal Rights Amendment is the 28th Amendment written into this one. So, and also record your history so you don't make the same mistakes over and over, and more importantly, so you learn what tactics worked. Amid the jubilation at the end of the campaign, there was also the recognition, especially among the leaders, that it would take more work to ensure equal rights. Yet they also had the belief that women having the vote would get that work done. Sadly, despite 100 years of voting, every day we see women's right to participate fully in every sphere of women's endeavor in this country, abridged or denied. And we see laws, judicial decisions, and executive actions aimed at protecting women's rights ignored, whittled, repealed, overturned. No number of such laws, judicial decisions, or executive actions will ever guarantee women's right to equal justice under the law. It will not happen. The only way it will happen is with a constitutional amendment. And that is why Alice Paul wrote the Equal Rights Amendment in 1923 and campaigned for it until her death, I believe, in 1973. Ninety-nine years later, we are still working to see it become the law of the land. Why? When so, women, so many women vote. In a democracy, the vote is the most important tool we have to build a society, government, and country we envision. Suffragists knew that by having men, men speak for them in the halls of political power, no matter how well intentioned they were, that was not enough to affect the change needed in their communities. Women needed to wield the vote themselves. Suffragists also knew, and we have learned this past 102 years, that having the vote is not enough to guarantee equal justice under the law for all. To do that, we need the voices of those who have women's best interests at heart, women, in the halls of political power, at all levels of government. And we need those voices to be in proportion to the representation of the population. Going forward, votes for women should be vote for women. And that should be the mantra until women are equally represented in our government. Not more than, we're, that, than we, you know, we won't take all the pie, but we want our share of the pie. And taking our share of the pie doesn't mean that there is less pie in terms of rights for anybody else. But only then, when we are, we are represented in government in the same proportion as in the population, will we have the even playing field on which to build the egalitarian nation that we want. I'll, I'll just finish with this. Uh, uh, in 1944, 
uh, it must have been Anita Pollitzer, who was a friend of Georgia O'Keeffe, uh, who convinced Georgia O'Keeffe, who really uh, was, was, was a feminist in her own way, in her own right, actually, but she was not an activist. But she convinced uh, Georgia O'Keeffe to write a letter to Eleanor Roosevelt asking her why Eleanor Roosevelt hadn't supported the Equal Rights Amendment yet. Why hadn't she come on board? And, and Joey O'Keefe said, it's because of women working for women's rights all of these years that you and women like you are able to have the lives they have. You know, why don't you come on and support the Equal Rights Amendment? I found this letter very interestingly in a, in a book of George O'Keefe's uh, letters and, and art, and uh, I was surprised, but delighted. So anyway, we will only have the even playing field on which to build our egalitarian nation when we are in the homes of power or as represented as we should be. We are 51% of the country. We can do this. Thank you.